Good morning, and welcome to this wonderful Palm Sunday. If you could sign the attendance pads and pass them down, that would be great. If you could draw a line and write 11 o'clock, that helps the people who enter them. So thank you for doing that. <clears throat> our prayer focus um, this week is we're going to start praying for our general conference. The Worldwide Church meets in about two months, so people from all over the world will be gathering in the United States. They meet every four years to vote on matters of the church, and so... Uh, they'll be meeting and discussing things that affect us or policy. So just be praying for all those delegates um, and everything with that. Uh, next Sunday is Easter, but it's also a fifth Sunday, and we take up an offering for the children's home every fifth Sunday. So just a reminder that we'll be taking up an offering next week to support our children's home, and you all have been very gracious to support the children's home, so thank you for that. Uh, this coming Thursday is Monday, Thursday. We call it Monday because Monday comes from the Latin word mandatum, which means commandment. And that Thursday before Easter is when Jesus gave a new commandment that you should love one another as I have loved you. So we call it Monday Thursday for that new commandment. If you're just a little bit of trivia there. Um, we're going to have it at 6 o'clock and we're going to do what's called a tenebrae service, which is read through the gospel readings about the passion of Christ. It's a very moving service, so I encourage you to come to that. Um, then on Sunday, we have the sunrise service at 6.30 at Pelican Beach Park. Um, they are not going to be enforcing the parking, I've been told. If you don't have a parking permit, they're not going to start enforcing it till 8 o'clock that morning when you should be gone. So <clears throat> you can get down there, but you've got to get there early to get a parking spot because we take up about half of it with the service. So that's going to be... Um, this coming Sunday at 6.30, and I'm the, going to be preaching that, that one this year. Our Easter egg hunt is also going to be an e Easter Sunday, and we're going to have it between the services, so it'll be a good time for the kids to go out and find eggs. But um, Shauna is still looking for people to stuff eggs. So if you want to stuff eggs, she's got eggs for you to stuff, and you can just see her after the service. And then our church picnic is going to be on April 14th at Pelican Beach Pavilion, that right after this service. And so I need you to, to sign up if you're coming so we know how many hot dogs and hamburgers to pie. Um, during that thing, they will be enforcing parking. And if you live in Satellite Beach or whoever want information out in the bulletin, we put the website there where you can go if you haven't registered. You really don't get a parking permit. You just register your license plate with it, and that's how they verify it. But there is a kiosk there if you just want to pay by the hour instead of paying for a non-resident parking pass. But I just put the information in the bulletin so you could get that. And then um, <clears throat> we're looking at having a church conference on April 7th at 3 p.m. Uh, that's two Sundays from now. And one of the things that we're going to be talking about is a proposal. It's not set in stone. We want to discuss it about selling our current parsonage and buying a smaller one. Uh, a, a still a four-bedroom in parsonage that's in Satellite Beach because the one we have is very energy efficient, so we want to talk about that idea. So that's going to be uh, on the April 7th at 3 p.m., and it's a church conference, so anybody who's a member of the church in a church conference has a vote. So hopefully you'll come out to that. Uh, we're still getting ideas, and people are putting together, is this a good idea or not? But with the change in pastor, it's a time for us to consider that to see if it's an avenue that we can save some money because it's an inefficient parsonage. Um, and also there are other houses available out there that are cheaper than what the parsonage can sell for. Our parsonage right now is valued about $850,000 because it's a very, very large parsonage. And there's homes out there that are still four bedrooms that we could purchase less and, and have money for air conditioners that are going to fail in the coming years. So that's what we're going to discuss then. So I wanted to just, we have to announce it in a plan. And that was, that's the only thing we'll be discussing and voting on at that, that conference. So that's going to be April 7th. So at this time, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship of, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
this time, let us stand for our call to worship. Oh God, you are my God. You are my God. Blessed he is he who comes to the in the name of the Lord. And let's remain standing as we sing together our gathering hymn, Hosanna, loud Hosanna. together in the Apostles Creed I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ his only Son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified dead and buried the third day he rose from the dead he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
you may be seated. We now come to the time where we lift up our prayer requests and praises. Any praises this morning? Yes. Yes, yeah, so yeah, Don Moore, his surgery, I know, went, went very well, and he's at Sea Pines now doing rehab. And if you're going to go visit him, call beforehand, because you might get there and have to wait for him to finish his rehab. <laughs> I forget what the schedule is, but I've, I've gotten caught that way a couple times. Yeah, Marilyn and I had our two grandsons this last week, so that was a praise to get them, and it was a praise to take them back. <laughs> I forgot how energetic a five-year-old is. <laughs> yes. 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 It's spring break. Yes. That's right. It's this. It's Brevard County spring break this coming week. It was my son's spring break last week. So they they stagger it out so everybody can come to Florida and spend a lot of money in Florida. Yes, Ellie. You're going to go to North Carolina and stay in a cabin. Well, that's a praise. Other praises. It's always good to start our prayer out with praises. That thanksgiving, that knowing that even in, when we're dealing with stuff, we can still praise God. But are there prayer requests that we want to lift up? Yes. Yes. Well, that's a praise. I'm glad you were here. <laughs> yes. So you missed some things this last week because you just didn't remember them. And we will be praying for you that that doesn't keep happening. Well, let us go to the Lord in prayer. O oh, God of grace and peace, God of love, God who gives us so much. Lord, you bless us in ways sometimes we see in ways we don't see. But you're always blessing us, always loving us, always guiding us, always helping us. And we thank you that you are always there, ever present, both in good and bad times. And Lord, we come here this morning just to empty ourselves of all the stuff we carry because you have come, called us to come and to leave it at the foot of the cross and that you will fill us with your goodness as we leave this day. And so, Lord, fill us with your peace and joy. Help us to deal with the things, Lord, that we are dealing with. Help us to find the happiness and peace that you offer in this life. And help us, Lord, to love as you have loved to be a neighbor as you have called us to be, to be a friend, to be one who cares about others. Lord, help us to be a people like that, a church like that, because we want to be your people. We want to love as you have loved. And Lord, as we come here this morning, we do remember those that are hurting. You have heard our repair requests and our praises that we have lifted up to you, Lord, and we lift them up to you because you are the one who can heal, restore, and you're the one who deserves our praise. But we also, Lord, lift up to you everyone that's on our prayer list. You know their needs, Lord. We just ask your blessing upon them, your healing, your restoration. And we even now, Lord, lift up to you that one name, that one request that is silent in our heart that we name before you now. And gracious Heavenly Father, in just a couple months, the worldwide church of the United Methodist Church will be meeting here in the United States. Delegates from all over the world will be traveling and coming to make decisions for the church, decisions that affect how we act, how we operate, and what we say we believe. 
And so, Lord, we ask that you guide all those, all those delegates. Be with them as they're traveling and they're preparing to travel. Lord, do not let them come with closed minds, but open to hear from one another, to hear from you, to be guided by you and your thoughts so that this church can be your church, that the United Methodist Church can continue strong in walking with you in everything it does. So, Lord, bless that convention. Bless the delegates. And, Lord, we do lift up this church to you because we want to be your church also. We want to be guided by your love, by your vision for this church. And so, Lord, we lift up the ministries of this church. I lift up all of those who come and give their time and their talents and their resources, Lord. So bring all of that together, Lord, so that we can come and be your church doing your will. Because, Lord, we know that is where we find you and find your peace. So bless, Lord, this church. And, Lord, we thank you for the precious gift of Jesus Christ who makes everything we do possible. We thank you that on Palm Sunday he entered as a king, not to rule over us, but to be a loving king who would lay down his crown, to die as a commoner, to die taking on our sins, so that today we can stand before you blame and wholeness. We thank you for that precious gift. And we now close the prayer and the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And at this time, we invite our children to head over to Children's Church. They'll go through the double doors over there and the room on the right, and then we'll return at the end of the service.
Amen. We now come to that time where we lift up our tithes and offerings, and if we invite the ushers to come forward at this time. And let us pray. O oh God of grace and peace and joy, we thank you for all the love you give us once again. We thank you for that when we're born, you give us talents, and when we come to say yes to you, you give us spiritual gifts all that we might be productive in this life, that we might find joy in doing and being. And Lord, now as we come and return just a portion of all that blessing back to you in the form of these our tithes and offerings, once again, Lord, we ask for you to multiply them. Guide us in their use. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. seated.
Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, the 11th chapter, beginning of the first verse. Hear now these words. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage in Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and we'll send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to twelve. One of the things I try and do to help others who have to put the service together is I try and prepare my sermon titles and scripture passages about four to five months ahead. This gives others time to prepare, gives hopefully the musicians at each service time to think about what the anthems they're going to sing, how they can put them with the different services. So usually what I do is I do about a quarter at a time, and about halfway through that quarter, I do the next quarter. And it, it's a, it helps me, and hopefully it helps the others. But one of the things when I was putting this quarter's readings together in Scripture passages, I noticed that Easter Sunday falls on the 31st of the month in March. It usually doesn't fall in March very often. And the very next day, we celebrate April Fool's Day. We do Easter on one day, and we become fools the next day. And I couldn't help but laugh, because those two actually go together. People look, huh? How does April Fool have to do with Easter? Well, it has everything. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, do not deceive yourselves. If any one of you thinks he is wise by the standards of this age, he should become a fool so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. Paul is telling us that accepting what Christ did on the cross, the world thinks we are fools. Well, April Fool's Day is a different kind of fool. That's where you go around and play tricks on people. And I don't know how many of you are going to do this. I fell for this one time. Are going to go on to have Facebook and change your birthday to April 1st. And then see how many people wish you a happy birthday on April 1st. I fell for this for some of my Facebook friends. But I always thought, who is the bigger fool? Are you the fool for wishing someone a happy birthday that they put on there and it just pops up and says, so-and-so has birthday today? Or are you a fool because your friends don't know when your birthday really is? (laughs) I always pondered that. Of course, there are some of the traditional jokes that people do on April's Fool Day. I read where someone suggested you get some super glue in a quarter and go down to Walmart and glue it to the sidewalk and watch people try and pick that thing up. And if you want to have a little more fun, you stand close by and you get an old piece of cloth and if they're wearing pants and they bend over, you rip the cloth while they're bending over and see their reaction. You never thought you'd hear these suggestions in church, did you? (laughs) Well, as I bring that up because I couldn't help but think On Palm Sunday, when Jesus tells two of his disciples to go into town, you'll come into town, as soon as you get there, there's going to be a colt or a donkey, depending on the translation, grab it and bring it back to me. It's as though they had to be thinking in their mind, this has got to be some practical joke on us. We're going to get in there, take this thing, and they're going to arrest us, or something bad's going to happen. And Jesus must have been thinking about that, because he immediately tells them, look, if if you go there and someone asks you a question, just tells them the Lord needs it and we'll send it back shortly. And I'm sure they were thinking as he said that, yeah, that is going to really answer the trick. That's going to do the trick for us when we're stealing this donkey. And there's actually 
people who today have a theological belief that Jesus was a thief because he stole a donkey on Palm Sunday. But he really didn't steal a donkey, he borrowed it. And what a lot of us don't realize is Jesus was just as comfortable with the wealthy as he was the poor. He was just as comfortable signing with those who had nothing as those who had everything. He was very comfortable in talking with them. And I'm almost sure in my mind that Jesus had this already arranged, that he had talked to some people, just like he had the borrowed room arranged, which was probably somebody wealthy, that somebody he knew had this donkey, and this was a prearranged thing. And the disciples went and did it without question because they believed Jesus. They were obedient to the task. They went out of this obedience because they trusted Jesus to know that he would never lead them astray. And once they did this, they then helped lead the celebration as Jesus rode into Jerusalem as a king, bringing peace. And I love this image that Jesus entered Jerusalem as a king. And I'm sure the disciples were excited that day, filled with great anticipation that Jesus would claim the throne of King David. Their hopes were welling up. They were just bubbling over with enthusiasm. This was a great day for them. And everyone was shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Because you have to think about what they were shouting. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. I'm sure the disciples were positive that Jesus was entering to claim the throne and bring peace once again to the Jerusalem. They were excited. And that's why they went to get this donkey, this colt. They knew something good was happening. And I'm sure they were shouting, they were dancing, they were laughing, they smiled. Life was good. It couldn't get any better for them this day. And it's fun to have those moments in life where everything is just exciting. You have no cares in the world. Even if you had cares in the world, this day is so great, you don't have cares. You ever have those days? I hope you have those days still. The problem is those days don't last. And for the disciples, that mood wasn't going to last either. See, the disciples were going to be taught an important lesson that we need to learn. Because a lot of us are good at praising God when life is good. We're good at praising God when everything is going great. We're not so good at praising God when everything is falling apart. And see, this week was going to fall apart for the disciples. They needed to learn the lesson Jesus had been trying to teach them the whole time he was with them, how to praise God when everything was falling apart. Because that's the way life is sometimes. It doesn't go the way we expected. How many of you know when the Tampa Bay Buccaneers started? It was back in 1976. Marilyn's dad was a pastor in Tampa, and after they started, people would sneak out of church early so they could go to the games. He, would have, he went to a game one time, he said, I stayed through the whole church and got there on time. You all shouldn't sneak out. Well, the first year of Tampa Bay's existence as a football team, they set an NFL record. They lost all 14 games. <laughs> There would be a record that would hold for 32 years until the Detroit Lions went 0-16 and replaced them out of the record. But the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, they weren't satisfied with just losing 14 games in a row. They would go on to lose 26 games in a row. And it wasn't until the second to last game of the season, they were in New Orleans and they beat a quarterback named Manning, intercepted him three times, returning all three for a touchdown, setting a record at the time, and won a game. The city came out to meet them as they got back from New Orleans on the buses. And not only did they win that week, they won the next week. And they rushed the field and they tore down the goalposts because they were 2 and 14. <laughs> they had learned how to persevere in the hard times through an 0 and 26 so that when the joy came, they could release the excitement. Even everyone else would probably think they were fools. But that's what Christ wants us to learn how to do, how to persevere in the bad times so that when the good comes, we can celebrate. Because we humans, we don't like the bad times. We don't like it when things are falling off. We want the empty tomb. We don't want Christ on a cross. But that's what Jesus entered Jerusalem today, that Palm Sunday on. Only Jesus knew that how this week would end. He had tried to, to tell the disciples, but they wouldn't hear it. 
He entered as a king, but he alone knew that he would lay down his crown for us. His kingship would not be a golden crown, but would be a crown of thorns. And it would not come to the cheers of the people that Good Friday, but it would be to the cries of the people to crucify him. And his disciples would scatter like roaches in a kitchen when you turn on the light. It's amazing that just in a matter of days, the disciples went from this mountaintop of believing that Christ was coming to usher in the kingdom of David to that Golgotha despair. And we resist that change too. Very few people today celebrate what we call Holy Week, the week between Palm Sunday and Easter. We want to skip over Monday, Thursday. We want to skip over Good Friday. We want to skip over Jesus weeping in the garden, the agony of the garden of Gethsemane. We don't want to deal with those things. We want to go straight from today to Easter, where Jesus was leaving a tomb empty, where Jesus has defeated death. But we need to take time to contemplate the cost of what the joy we have is. Because when we contemplate that, we see the depth of the love Jesus has for us. We need to struggle with Jesus as he struggled so that we can rejoice like those Tampa Bay Buccaneers did when they finally won, when Jesus is risen. And after all, I mean, we like Easter. It's one of the two Sundays the church is filled. After this, we've got to wait all the way till Christmas to get everybody to come again. <laughs> and Easter is full of new clothes, new hats, big dinners. But the reality of life is that happy is not always where we are. And praising God and loving God does not have to be dependent on our circumstances, and it shouldn't be dependent on our circumstances. Christ took on our sorrows so that we might survive our sorrows. You have to think about that. Christ took on our sorrows so that we might make it through our sorrows. That's how much he loves us. That we might never be without hope. That is what we praise collectively each Sunday. That Christ paid the price for it all. And we, like the disciples on the day of Jesus entering Jerusalem, still needed to learn that it's not praising God in the good times that matters. We need to praise him in the good times. But really, when it, we praise God in the bad times, that's when it makes the most, when it impacts us the most, when it has the most powerful. And one of the tragedies, even before I went in the ministries, after I went in the ministries, one of the biggest heartaches I have is to watch people get angry at their life, angry at something, and leave the church. They get angry at God because this happened. They get angry at someone, and they think that's not the way Christians are supposed to be, and they leave the church. And they leave the church because they have a bad theology. They have a theology that says, if you come to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, nothing bad will ever happen to you again. And you can read the Bible from front to back, and that is not what it says. It never says that. What it does says is if you come to accept Christ, there will be a power to, to help you get through those dark times. And what's sad about our country is when we get mad at God because life isn't good, our life is good, even when it's bad. I've had the ability to go and look at missions and work in different parts of the world, and life is hard. People sleep on dirt floors. People don't have clean waters to drink. Our bad times are good and we still complain to God it's not good enough. We need to learn to praise God at all times. See, Christ did not come to die on the cross because our lives were so wonderful. He came to die because our lives are filled with things that lead to death. And it would be lovely if this world was filled with no death, no disease until we lived to a ripe old age and then died quickly into heaven. But the reality is that not, is not how God has allowed this world to operate. It is filled with both wonderful things and horrible things. It is filled with people who will give you the shirt off your back and it is filled with people who will steal the shirt off your back. It's a world that we can freely choose what we want to do. We can be selfish or we can be giving. 
We can help others or we can hurt others. We can seek our own pleasure over the pleasure and pain of anybody else. It'd be great if this world, like I said, was filled with kindness and love everywhere we went. But that's not a reality, but that's the way we are supposed to live. To show people what it means to live even in the hard times. We aren't going to live a perfect life. We're not created to live perfect lives here because this world is not the place we are destined for. But we can receive a perfect love. We can experience God's love perfectly. And no matter what the circumstances, God is going to give us that love. And what I have found over the years, and what we need to remember, if you really want to find Christ, if you want to go to where he's entering some great place, go to where people are hurting. Go to where people are suffering, and there Christ is in all his power and majesty. And when you go to work there, you will find Christ. See, Jesus is with the woman at the well. He's not with all the women who are coming later laughing together. He's with the woman at the well who's all alone. Jesus is not dining with the rich and popular. He's dining with the outcast and the hated. Jesus is the one standing with a woman who's about to be stoned. He's hanging on the cross with a criminal who needs forgiveness. Go to where people are hurting and that's where you'll find Jesus. And when we remember Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem this Palm Sunday, we remember that this is a day punctuated with hope. It was a day filled with hope for the future. This Thursday and Friday, when we are busy getting ready for the festivities of Easter, I hope you will pause and remember and to praise God that it was Thursday and Friday's events before Easter that put this wonder into motion. It was the pain of the garden that Jesus experienced. It was the pain of the cross on Golgotha that Jesus experienced so that we might find joy and hope today. Jesus freely did this out of his love for us. He entered Jerusalem not to be a king, but to be a king who would lay down his crown for us. No greater love can there be. This week, contemplate on that love so that on Easter we can celebrate truly He is risen. Let us pray. Grace Heavenly Father, we do thank You that Your love is so great that You sent Your one and only Son to die on the cross for us, to take all of our junk, all of our sins, all of our bad things unto Himself and receive the punishment that, is, that we deserve. Lord, help us not to be saddened by this fact, but to be lifted up that we are loved this much. That this is a love that cannot be taken from us. This is a love that will propel us into a powerful future. Even death cannot take this power and this future away from us. Help us to know that every day of our lives, to live it, so that when the bad times come, we can praise you, and when the good times come, we can celebrate more powerfully with you. Lord, help us to praise your name every day. And it's in your name we do praise and pray. Amen. Please stand together for our closing hymn, number 415, Take Up Thy Cross.
And as we prepare to leave today, let us reach up and grab God's hand. He's never going to let you go. He's going to walk with you both in the wonderful times and the hard times. So go in his strength. Go in his powerful love. Go in his presence and share it with the world. Amen.